Connected uh, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion team at the State Board uh, and more. So well, we'll just give it a couple more seconds and then we will launch. Okay, we're getting close. <clears throat> what do you say team? Should we go ahead and kick off? Yeah. Sound good? Great. So I think what we'll do is Christina, while well, she's already on top of it. <laughs> so wonderful. Christina, if you don't mind, uh, we can kick off into the second slide there. Great. Well, thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, feel free to share your name, title, college, and reason for joining us in the chat. Put a little guy there. And uh, please feel free to share your personal pronouns as well. Um, so please be courteous to others and speak clearly and slowly. The auto transcription will be provided in Zoom and the presentation will be recorded and put on our new EDI website, which I will link in the chat as well. Um, please see our accessibility statement. C SBCGC is committed to providing equal access for individuals with disabilities to its programs and events in accordance with ADA and 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. And again, I'm Christina, and if you need any assistance with uh, technology or additional questions, please don't hesitate to re reach out to me. That's great. Thanks, Christina. All right. I think we can probably move to the next slide and take this beautiful opportunity in front of all of you uh, to introduce the very first Equity, Diversity, Inclusion team, the State Board. Thanks to the good leadership of Daniel Shawara and many others uh, across our system, particularly our DOC colleagues. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm trying to work with my acronyms, my, the Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Officers Commission Group, who have really advanced the work across our uh, state system, as well as many others. Uh, we now have a dedicated team and you see us uh, in live on Zoom. And then of course, on the PowerPoint slide deck in front of you. So uh, my name is Ha Wen, uh, for those of you who I haven't had the pleasure of meeting yet. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And I have the honor of serving as the director of this team. And I'm coming to you <laughs> on the ancestral lands. Um, <laughs> thank you, Phyllis. Hopefully you're feeling okay. Um, I'm coming to you from the ancestral lands of the Coast Salish and Puyallup tribes. And uh, I'm gonna give some space to introduce, uh, for Melissa and Christina to introduce themselves as well. Yeah, thank you. I'm Melissa Williams. My pronouns are she, her. Uh, I am the Policy Associate <coughs> for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion at the State Board. I'm new to the role and coming from Clark College. So shout out to my Clark College peeps in the room. Uh, and I am in Vancouver, Washington. So I am on the ancestral lands of the Cowlitz and Chinook and other Lower Columbia peoples. Uh, and I'll pass to Christina. Thank you. Um, I'm Christina Pleasance, the Administrative Assistant for the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion team. My pronouns are she, her. I'm super excited to be in this work with Hall and Melissa, lovely people, and truly <laughs> grateful and proud to be a part of the State Board. Um, I've already learned a lot in this role, and I look forward to uh, all the good work that we're doing with our students and our communities. Uh, let's go. go ahead, Melissa. Right. We do want to begin with a land acknowledgement and a labor acknowledgement. And I'll read through. And as I'm reading through, uh, please, if you will, in the chat, put uh, which lands you're on uh, and honor the, the folks past, present, and future um, whose lands we occupy. If you know that information, please feel free to share in the chat um, as I read this land acknowledgement for us. SBCTC acknowledges that our community resides on the ancestral lands of the First Peoples. The Office of the Washington State Board for Community and Technical Colleges is located in Olympia on the Coast Salish lands of the Nisqually, Cowlitz, and Squaxin people. 
We ask you to join us in celebrating the indigenous tribes of Washington by acknowledging their ancestral lands, their communities, and the past, present, and future generations of the native peoples across our good state. We know that such statements only become truly meaningful when coupled with authentic relationships and sustained commitment. Uh, and as such, we commit to continued efforts to build our collective understanding and action to foster authentic native community connections. Um, and so think about um, in your work or in your personal lives, how you are working to foster those meaningful connections um, with indigenous folks and native peoples. Uh, and there are so many different ways to do that and people do really great work um, forging those relationships. And so we encourage you to continue that work. Uh, and on the next slide, I will um, give a labor acknowledgement. Uh, we also acknowledge that our nation and our institutions have benefited from the free enslaved labor of black people. We recognize the interconnected histories of indigenous peoples who were forcibly removed from their land and of those who were forcibly brought to it. We acknowledge the enduring impacts of the African diaspora, honor the contributions, talents, and dreams of our black communities. Uh, we acknowledge the immigrant labor that has contributed to the nation as a critical labor force, including voluntary, involuntary, trafficked, forced and undocumented peoples. We recognize and honor their significant contributions. In these acknowledgements, we, could, we commit to the essential work of moving beyond awareness to action through meaningful changes at our institutions and in our communities. So thank you for um, allowing us to present those acknowledgements to you and for reflecting on those too as we move forward. Uh, so I will uh, share quickly the purpose of today's session. Uh, and we um, have outlined three primary takeaways uh, for you. And uh, we'll begin with um, the State Board highlighting the Diversity and Equity Officers Commission work and the significance to the equity, diversity, and inclusion work that we do uh, at our different campuses. And so um, the State Board is invested in elevating the voices and the expertise and labor of the members uh, of the DEOC. Um, and the equity officers ought to serve as a primary resource for colleges in shaping the efforts around Bill 5194 and uh, 5227. Um, and so we are working collaboratively with with the uh, diversity and equity officers um, so that we get input from them and uh, calling on their expertise and so that we can use their uh, voices in shaping the guidance that we are providing to all of the colleges. So it's very important to us that we are um, uh, working with that group. Um, yes, thank you. Diversity and Equity Officers Commission is DEOC. Thank you, Rashida. Uh, and several of the members of that commission are here. Um, and so that is one of the purposes of today's session uh, is to elevate that, their voices and that work, and then also to um, have us be mindful of them as a resource in this work. And then also the significance of the state bills to advance equity, diversity, and inclusion work uh, in our system and in higher ed. Uh, the bills are an opportunity for us to operationalize equity and anti-racism efforts and social justice across our community and technical colleges. Um, and we know that this work is critical. Uh, that's evidenced in, in our equity gaps and the disparities that we see uh, that we have long seen in our uh, in the information and the data coming from our colleges. Um, and so this is one more effort to um, encourage our institutions to focus on this critically important work and to, to create equitable learning and working experiences for students and employees. Uh, and then lastly, the actions of our college. We want to recognize the incredible and amazing work that colleges have been doing already um, for many, many years. Uh, many colleges are way ahead of the game um, in thinking equitably and uh, creating <coughs> a sense of belonging, inclusion, equity, anti-racism, and social justice, uh, and really advancing those efforts on their campuses. And so we want to acknowledge and thank you for that work. And we want to be able to support those existing efforts and and also assist colleges in designing and implementing new efforts uh, to scale so that uh, we can support the campus communities and the broader communities um, in doing this. So that's the purpose uh, of this session. And then we, you will be able to hear uh, the, from uh, representatives from different colleges about the specific 
initiatives, <laughs> efforts that they have made uh, toward this work. Anything I've left out, Pa or Christina? I wanna make sure I capture everything. Melissa, I think you covered it beautifully. Thank you. All right. Okay, so uh, we're going to move quickly into a brief overview and an update on uh, Senate Bills 52 to 27 and 5194. Uh, these are two bills that shine a light on the importance of cultivating campus spaces where our students, particularly our students of color and minoritized students, feel a real sense of belonging and support for their success. Uh, the bill also posits that our faculty, staff, and administrators play a key role in creating this environment. So thanks to the good work of many of the colleges in the Zoom room today who stepped into the fire with us this last legislative session and provided testimony for uh, critical components of these bills and helping legislators to uh, perfect them even further. So a big shout out to the DEOs in the room, Dr. Rashida Willard, uh, Parfait Basile, Robert Britton, Dr. Valerie Hunt, uh, also from IC uh, Instruction Commission, Dr. Sayumi Ayri, uh, there were presidents and trustees that stepped in to testify also as well. Uh, shout out to Dr. Rosie Romando Transap from South Seattle uh, College, Dr. Ivan Harrell from TCC, Dr. Timothy Stokes from South Puget, Dr. John Mosby from Highline, Doug Ma, trustee from South Puget Sound. Uh, so a number of individuals and collective effort uh, to ensure that this legislation passed in the last session. Uh, also like to acknowledge again, Melissa did a really nice job of doing that, uh, but that there's been a whole host of equity efforts across our system for a good number of years. I uh, see many of you who have been a part of that here today, um, led by many of you. We're incredibly grateful for these new legislative investments to further advance and scale this work that you've led. Uh, the colleges as well as SBCTC received some funding in our operational uh, budget appropriation to support these efforts. So. With that, again, Melissa pointed to our um, intention, our deep intention to work with our uh, Diversity and Equity Officers Commission group to elevate and amplify their expertise and intellect in these areas. We would encourage you to stay close to uh, those individuals uh, and work collaboratively uh, in leadership uh, with them on your campuses, should you uh, have uh, th that role on your campus. Um, if not, please feel free to reach into us for any additional support or guidance uh, in reaching the requirements of these bills and helping to advance your equity efforts. We are here. Uh, the President's Equity Committee and the Trustees Equity Committee and other grassroots groups uh, also work to support the colleges in implementing the requirements of these two diversity bills. Um, all that cover, we'll cover them uh, pretty succinctly now. Uh, but they covered the DEI strategic plan, some hiring strategies, campus climate surveys, outreach uh, and peer mentoring and so forth. So I am going to hand it off back to Melissa. Uh, one mm -hmm. thing we are aware of, I wanna make sure that we give opportunity for questions to emerge, whether that comes uh, within the chat, we'll try to respond to them as much as possible. We will be capturing them um, and responding afterwards if we're not able to get to all of them. We also have uh, an opportunity for individuals to uh, add questions into a Google Doc uh, that we will be compiling uh, to get uh, responses to you as well. So with that, I will uh, hand off to Melissa to review uh, Senate Bill 5227. Yeah, thank you. And uh, as Ha mentioned, this will be very succinct and you will be able to hear later from our colleague Summer Kennison about um, more detail um, related to this these pieces here that I'm gonna cover. Um, so more information to come, but three key components or deliverables from uh, the Bill 5227, diversity in higher ed, um, are the campus climate assessments, listening and feedback sessions and professional development and training. So some of you, many of you, maybe most of you are familiar with the elements uh, here already, um, but I'm sure there are questions and we will, um, as Ha said, allow you to um, submit questions. Uh, so campus climate assessments, colleges shall each conduct a campus climate assessment every five years at minimum. And the purpose of those assessments is to understand the current state of diversity, equity, and inclusion on campus for faculty, staff, and students. So for the whole community, um, and also to use the information gleaned from those assessments 
in developing uh, professional development and training opportunities. Um, so really utilizing that data uh, to the best of your ability. And so at a minimum of every five years, um, uh, many colleges that conduct campus climate assessments already are doing them more frequently than that. Um, so that probably wouldn't be a challenge for those of you who are already using campus climate, climate assessments, um, but that's the minimum there. Uh, listening and, oh, and, and po posting the um, findings on um, a public website as well. And that, that is the same for the listening and feedback sessions. And so transparency is a part of this process. That was an important uh, element of the bill uh, is to um, have, have the colleges report out uh, the information that they're gathering. And so for the listening feedback sessions, that information will be uh, posted as well on public websites. Uh, and colleges must conduct annual diversity, equity, and inclusion listening and feedback sessions for the whole campus community. Uh, so students included, of course. And again, the purpose of that and the significance of it is to um, have that in real time um, information coming from folks who are being impacted by the climate and using that information uh, to inform your initiatives and efforts in uh, equity. Uh, and then professional development and training. So providing diversity, equity, and inclusion and anti-racism training to faculty, staff, and students. Uh, creating uh, an evaluation for the participants to uh, be able to assess uh, the development and the training, um, share completed evaluations and other program information with uh, SBCTC annually, and then uh, posting the DEI training framework on public websites. Um, so those are the three main components. And um, because many colleges are already doing work this work or work very similar to it. Um, there are some institutions will be tweaking what they're already doing. Uh, some institutions may be starting more from scratch. Uh, so it really depends. We've got a continuum of experience uh, you know, across the system, but we are here to, to help uh, guide and to answer questions. And again, um, Summer will be giving more in-depth information a little bit later. Uh, so that's our brief overview of this bill. Um, and I see Valerie's hand up. Dr. Hunt, is that you? You're muted if you're speaking. Okay, we might connect back with you uh, later. So uh, I'll pass it along to Ha. Great, thank you, Melissa. So moving on to uh, Senate Bill 5194, uh, Equity and Access in Higher Ed. I'm going to be focusing on two sections of that bill. This is the kitchen sink bill, if you will. So it was a very complex bill that included a, a number of different elements um, across a number of different areas. Uh, so for purposes of today, uh, we concentrated uh, specifically on section three and section five. Uh, so for section three, this is the overall DEI strategic plan. So there's really one producible, one deliverable that's overarching. Uh, and that is the DEI plan that would include all of what you see in front of you. So a plan that includes a culturally appropriate student outreach program. Many of you, again, may have already have this strategy established uh, for a number of years and have been pretty successful and effective in that. You'll get to hear today from uh, South Puget Sound on how they've coupled um, this work with the peer mentoring strategies on their campus. Uh, so be thinking again about some of the work that you've already been doing that meets the uh, expectations and requirements of this section. Uh, so the student outreach program, the peer mentoring strategies, uh, including opportunities from student, for students from minoritized communities to form student-based organizations to assist each other in navigating the educational system. So a lot of peer mentoring, how are you doing that already on your campuses? How might you be thinking about incorporating that moving forward? Um, and I'm gonna skip down to the DEI definitions. Uh, so again, back to the idea of transparency, colleges must include definitions in their strategic plans, uh, as well as posting them on their websites. Um, <clears throat> So if I'm working on a college and I'm developing a strategic, strategic plan, um, I'm going to be including all four of these components within that plan. As some of you may have already incorporated this, uh, we might be surprised if you haven't already because colleges have been looking for a good number of uh, years at how to do outreach, how to provide support for peer-to-peer -peer mentoring um, and a number of different items that they've been doing to help uh, support stu student success, especially for students of color and minoritized students. Um, 
For the faculty diversity program, this is a, a little bit different. We've got a, a, a guidance document, a support document, uh, a template of sorts to share uh, with all of you. You will find it in the Google Drive uh, that might help to uh, support if you haven't already created a diversity program on your campus for um, in, um, increasing the uh, diversity of your faculty ranks. So that's something that we'll speak to um, in, <clears throat> in just a little bit. But again, the overarching deliverable is a, a strategic plan. Um, one of the questions we've received from a number of different uh, colleges is uh, depending on where your college is within their overall strategic uh, college plan, uh, is that sufficient to meet the requirements of this section? Um, I would say yes if your plan already has these items included. Uh, if you have the opportunity to include these items um, within your plan, if you're in that cycle of accreditation where you're writing out your college uh, strategic plan, then I would look to include it as part of that. Um, if not, other colleges have um, decided to create their own standalone equity plan that is inclusive of all these items. I'm gonna go ahead and move on to the second piece there. I think you're on the same slide, uh, Christina, yes, for section five? Sorry, I'm not seeing the same screen. Yes. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Uh, so this is section five of the kitchen sink bill and that is full-time tenured positions. And so <clears throat> many of you would have already received some guidance from our office from Troy Holiday in regards to the uh, conversion uh, full-time tenured positions uh, of the 200 new full-time tenured positions uh, within this section of the bill. Uh, please do keep in mind when implementing these conversions that there's a specific intent uh, from the legislator to, le legislature to have the conversions align with the college's uh, strategic plans. And so it points back to uh, the faculty diversity program I mentioned in the earlier slide. So there has to be some connective tissue and uh, work between these two bills in regards to ensuring that the faculty diversity program is included in the DEI strategic plan and that the conversions, um, the adding of the 200 new faculty conversions is informed by um, that plan. Um, and then of course, uh, the third bullet strongly suggest and encourage utilizing that as well as that guidance uh, to inform that. Can you, I think, there we go. And I think what we're gonna do, Christina, I'm gonna have you go, uh, actually, since you've already advanced, I'll, I'll go ahead and go from here. Thanks everyone for your grace and patience. Uh, so this is an implementation timeline to help us a visual. If at all helpful, uh, uh, we'll be pulling up an Excel sheet to sort of go through what we just um, previewed for you in regards to an overview of those bills. But this is a timeline by academic year of what you would be looking at in terms of implementation and meeting deadline. So if you're looking at academic year 21, uh, 22, which is what we're currently in, colleges should be considering now if you haven't already conducting your campus climate assessments. Uh, during ledge session, we uh, wanted to stay true uh, to colleges' um, uh, nature of local control and, so, and not to dismiss colleges who have already been doing this work and have already conducted campus climate assessments. So if you've already done uh, some of that work, we don't want to dismiss those findings. But for those who have not, uh, you're looking at conducting your campus climate assessment in tandem with the development of your DEI strategic plan. Uh, those two should inform each other as well as the findings informing the professional development training pieces. So a lot of these items are going to hold hands with each other. Uh, so in this upcoming academic year, uh, you're looking at uh, sort of two big deliverables and that is the climate assessment and submitting those DEI strategic plans. And of course, many colleges may have already started doing this in regards to thinking about their hiring uh, timeline for the 200 new full-time tenure track positions. 
as you as you move across, you'll see that the listening and feedback sessions fall on the years that the uh, campus climate assessments are not conducted. Now that doesn't limit a college from conducting a campus climate um, assessment annually. Um, you're not required to, you're required to every five years, but it doesn't limit you if you, um, uh, as <clears throat> a college practice, uh, conduct climate assessments annually. So just as uh, to make you aware of that, uh, the listening and feedback sessions, though, should occur every year that the campus climate assessment does not. And Summer will be talking a little bit about the guidance around uh, how to conduct uh, and select you know, the cl campus climate assessment as well as the listening and feedback sessions. And you'll see uh, beginning academic year 2023, we're looking at um, colleges providing uh, anti racist DEI training for all new faculty and staff. Um, and then with uh, 80 the goal of 80% of total faculty and staff completing training after two years. Um, and then of course, being transparent and posting DEI definitions and terms on the website. There's also the requirement again for program evaluations um, and so on uh, as we move forward. So you'll see that there's uh, an eventual scaling across the next uh, five, six years in regards to uh, ensuring that faculty, staff, and students are receiving training, uh, that colleges are, uh, are <clears throat> assessing their campus climate um, and looking at any growth areas or gaps to fill in regards to providing additional training. And I'm going to hold on a second and see if I can't uh, screen share. Another item, uh, if you'll just hold one second. So is everyone seeing what I'm seeing? The Excel sheet? Yes. You are, wonderful, thank you. So everybody has a copy of this in the, the Google Drive, the shared Google Drive um, with all attendees. Uh, but this again is just another visual to assist with the, your planning efforts and your implementation. So just starting with I think 5227, we're looking at the campus climate assessments the listening and feedback sessions and the professional development and training uh, components of that bill. Um, so uh, deliverables written under each of those areas with timelines embedded. Um, State board here for the campus climate assessments, you're gonna hear a little bit again about that from summer. Uh, you'll also receive the uh, guidance document within that shared Google Drive as well. Trying to, oops. Sorry, everyone, I can't uh, get this thing to minimize. So I can, there we go. Uh, <clears throat> how I cannot yes. see the Excel spreadsheet. Are you sharing it by screen or are you sharing it with us? I'm sharing it on the screen. I thought somebody um, said in affirmative that you could see it, no? I can see it on the screen. I just didn't know if it was also shared sent to us. Thank you. Okay. And components of 5194 DEI strategic plan says again the overarching deliverable with these items underneath embedded within it. Um, and I just want to take a couple seconds to point to the model faculty diversity template that'll be shared uh, within that Google Drive as well. Uh, and we'll be reviewing that just really uh, briefly today. But this is an item that is a, uh, something that uh, State Board will be providing. It is not an item that um, colleges have to come up with a model program. Uh, it's something that uh, the colleges would hopefully is uh, useful to colleges as they continue to develop their own. Okay, 
I think we're on to the next slide, Christina. So again, Christina, would you drop the Google uh, Doc for questions, uh, a link into the chat? We could take a few minutes just to, if there's any questions that are emerging, uh, just really quickly. Uh, feel free also to add into the Google Drive any and all questions and we'll respond to those as well. Okay, not seeing any come through on chat. Uh, Christina, you'll just monitor. I see Robert raised his hand. Yes, uh, th thank you for uh, providing this information session. It's been very uh, enlightening thus far. And my question is around the, uh, the ability of colleges to create, in addition to these components, part of the uh, 50 to 27 component is that whole aspect of tracking and monitoring uh, the trainings that individuals do uh, but every other year or every two years. And mm -hmm. I'm wondering, because that can be somewhat of a very tenuous process and a very big lift for many mm -hmm. institutions, especially without an infrastructure already in place to track, monitor, and evaluate these particular uh, trainings. And so one of the, the questions that I have is that, can we tie into CTC link as the tracking mechanism for these particular trainings, because then it's just a matter of running a report as opposed to having, and with CTC link, all of our information travels with us from institution to institution. So an individual wouldn't have to do the training again if they transferred to another institution. Mm -hmm. So it's just one of those things is that <clears throat> we could look at to try and see if we can uh, create a template within CTC link as the tracking mechanism for all of these training system wide. That's beautiful, Robert. I'm going to make sure to, to look into that a little bit further. I think that's a, uh, an incredible uh, idea to be able to do the tracking. I know uh, some of our colleges have been able to incorporate a tracking system. I think Rashid from Clark might be pointing to some of the work that they've been doing already in regards to that, but I think that this is uh, a system level solve, if you will. So let me look into that. Thank you, Robert. It's a question from Claire. Thank you, Claire, uh, in the chat. Is there guidance on what constitutes a DEI definition? Are these college DEI statements or something else? So my under, I'm sorry, Melissa, did I cut you off? Oh, no, go ahead. So my understanding is uh, they're not statements, but rather, and feel free to have, if you don't already have a college DEI statement, uh, but the definitions themselves are for any of the language that is being used with any kind of reports or communication on, on your websites uh, with other stakeholders to students that uh, you would be using uh, in regards to this work. So <clears throat> I think that there's been a number of colleges. I, th I thought I saw some shares from, I don't know if she's here in the room today, but Cheryl Nunez has done some great work in collecting some of that. Um, I think uh, from Olympic College, there's been uh, a number of colleges that have already started doing some of that work. I think uh, Robert from Lake Washington has started on that work or has already completed that work. So there's some good, um, individuals and in colleges across our system who have gotten uh, out of the gate on this item. Uh, but again, it's not just a DEI statement per se, but rather ensuring that the language we're using to communicate our work is um, universal and understandable. Okay, thank you. I, I still don't quite understand, so maybe I need to see some examples because I suspect at Skagit we're doing this, but I don't know. Are and so I just want to make sure that I know what what the task is um, because I if it's a matter of defining you know what equity is versus what diversity is versus what inclusion is as a baseline you know that's one project um, if it's something else I just want to make sure that we're you know aligning and I find it interesting that college 
is perhaps creating its own definitions um, versus a shared systemic definition. Mm -hmm. So that's a, another, I guess, question about this work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, that's. May I raise my hand up for that? I raise my hand on my phone. I think you're back on mute, Dr. Hunt. I went back on mute out of respect, but I want to know how to raise my hand to respond to that. Uh, feel free to respond. I think we, I think we're good. The um, the um, DEOC community was very well aware that the, that it becomes a quagmire <laughs> to not have a standard, tractable theoretically sound and praxis oriented uh, EDI definitions because from the definitions come policies and practices. And so it, I would strongly suggest that, uh, that uh, folks avail themselves of the work that we have done, not for our own, our own selves, but for the integrity of the work that is being done <coughs> statewide. I appreciate that, Valerie. And just to, to your point, um, Claire, I think uh, in in sort of recognizing the work that Skagit Valley has done, I think that uh, uh, you certainly wouldn't be starting from scratch, uh, for sure. But I appreciate the the system level thinking across the board um, on these items. So whether it's about the tracking piece through CGC Link or uh, definitions at a system level. So we can, uh, again, I would encourage uh, colleges to reach into their uh, DEO uh, officers if you have one on your campus. Um, and if not, feel free to reach into us as well. We can get you connected um, and can help to support your work in this. Okay, thank you so much both, mm -hmm. Valerie. I think um, I, you know, I, I in the spirit of what Dr. Hunt is suggesting, I think it's all the more reason for sort of a systemic definition um, because it, it does connect to the policy. So, um, you know, I know there's always debates about local control versus, you know, whole system. Um, but when we're talking about definitions that impact policies, it, it would be helpful to have sort of a, a shared understanding. As a matter of fact, I'm going, uh, I will offer that our DEOC will provide some sort of listening and learning session uh, to, to uh, reflect the work that people have, that we've done oh, oh, for the past three odd years and beyond. And right. your lovely Yadira, I think Yadira is still with you. Oh yeah. It, it's on the executive leadership and she yes, is, has exactly. also been an adamant person about uh, definitions practice and policy. So y'all yeah. are, are, are all in, all in alignment. Yep, we yep. are happy to do that. Okay? okay, great. We will do that. Great, thank you so much. And we're coming up on time. I do see two more hands up, I believe, or unless Robert, is that your hand up still? Did you forget to put down or do you have another question? Nope, you're good. I think I saw Stephanie. Yeah, thank you, Ha. Um, I had a question about um, implementation recommendations. Well, I understand that that there is uh, local preference, and I encourage that. I think that uh, and research demonstrates that that locally relevant curriculum, pedagogy, teaching methods, et cetera, are essential to to creating effective uh, systemic changes. But on the other hand, I think it would be really helpful if we had more recommendations. And I think especially to recognize the work that has already happened across the state. So for example, um, the DEHPE group um, or DHPD group that had the 17 steps for hiring, recruiting and retaining. And so I wonder how how is the existing work so within institutions, there are grassroots movements, but there's also been a lot of movements across the state. And some of those people were really ad advocates for this legislation and are very involved in it in various methods. But how 
how can we ensure that people who want to build on that work or um, provide remunerated opportunities for collaboration <coughs> for those experts, how do they identify? Because for people starting out this work or systematizing it for the first time, they may not know who those experts are. And I think it's also a way of um, opening the discussion about how the invisible workloads of faculty that are involved in DEI work, mm -hmm. staff, students, all of the advocates in our educational systems of DEI work are doing it um, for the most part, if they have a title that's not a DEI title as it's almost an extracurricular activity. It's certainly unpaid, an unpaid form of labor that this bill, especially since it talks about retention, um, one of the things that has for, for myself being real vulnerable and then wanting to identify who might resonate with this feeling that un, unpaid labor, which to me is the most valuable labor is the DEI labor, is the labor that's not most essential to retaining my job, right? So as a faculty member, I have to um, attend classes on the schedule, report grades by a certain deadline, submit certain paperwork. So the things that are uh, objectively valued in the systems and like expressly valued discreetly in the systems at work are not DEI things. Mm -hmm. So the DEI things then become optional, right? They're designed to be optional within our systems. So I think that many institutions struggle to find how to recognize that work and create space for the people who are doing that work already to to be leaders of it on their campus and to share their expertise while balancing all of the requirements of their workload. Um, and that's not a question that I think I need an answer for now. I guess it's more of an existential question. Mm -hmm. No, I appreciate that, Stephanie. I know that uh, one of the things that we want to be really intentional about as a uh, department and hoping to uh, lead to the best of our ability in this work is to how to elevate and amplify uh, the work that's been occurring at, in a number of different areas from a number of different people across our system. So with that, uh, that means taking a look at the current uh, infrastructure that we have built uh, within our own formal uh, system, that is the commissioning councils and the hierarchical nature of that, and who's missing at the table from those council and commissions. Um, so there have been some robust grassroots efforts from a number of faculty and staff. We want to honor that work at every turn. I know one of the things that we've attempted to do in the last year, um, and I'll make this quick uh, as an example, is through the WAC Equity Committee and uh, leaving space for um, some emerging groups that came through as an offshoot, I believe, from the DEHPD group that you mentioned, uh, and that is the DEI and Washington CTCs group. So a really informal uh, group that we want to make sure are invited to the tables. We're looking to, to do that as well. Uh, some of the other areas that you mentioned in the 17 steps of hiring pointed to that in the faculty diversity model template. So we're trying to be as inclusive as possible to honor the work that's been done across our system. Some um, incredible work. But I hear you. Uh, and I want you to know that we're, we're um, thinking about that at every turn on how to do that. Uh, and thank you for posing that and bringing that up uh, for everyone to, to consider that as well. So I am going to we're going to have to move forward. Again, feel free to use uh, the Google Doc uh, to pose any questions. We'll make sure to get back with uh, those responses um, as soon as we can. And you'll see in front of you sort of the rundown of the next sessions. This is the piece around state board guidance on the uh, campus climate assessment, um, as well as the faculty diversity model template, and then some college highlights. Uh, so Christina, I'll have you go to the next slide. And I'm going to go ahead and hand this off to Summer Kennison, who is our Interim Director of Research at the State Board. Thank you, Ha. Um, and as Ha mentioned, I'm the Interim Director of Policy Research at the State Board. Um, although I have been working with Ha on the 
campus climate assessments and the listening and feedback sessions prior to moving into that position and we'll stay with that once the director position is built. <coughs> so in the interest of consistency, um, I just wanted to, to make that, that clear. Uh, so what I, I want to do is um, kind of have a, a walk through some of the expectations of the bill around the campus climate assessments uh, and the listening and feedback sessions and share some of the guidance um, and recommendations that the state board can provide as colleges want to move forward with this. Uh, you can see on this slide, there is an expectation that the findings of the campus climate assessment need to clarify the current state of DEI in classrooms, common areas, libraries, support services, and if you have it, residential accommodation. And that's a pretty broad range, and it really is intended to cover a, the student, faculty, and staff lived experiences at all times when they are working with the college. However, the campus climate assessments can also go a little bit deeper um, and broader. So if you are using an instrument that also has components that address other aspects of discrimination, um, sexual assault, Title IX um, content, um, and other pieces, that does not mean that you cannot, you cannot combine those tools. But if you are combining those tools, it's still very, very important to make sure that the expectations of the bill as far as the DEI experience at the college uh, remains forefront. There is a requirement to consult with faculty, diversity officers, staff, and students on the development or selection of, an inst of a survey instrument for the CCAs. Now, that if you are, are already using a campus climate assessment and you want to continue to use that, um, there's no, there's nothing to restrict you in doing that, but that does not negate this requirement. So while we don't want to limit colleges use of the data that they may have already collected in the past, and by all means, you know, we're encouraging that. So if you've already completed uh, recently campus climate assessments or you have longitudinal data on this, you know, we encourage you to, to continue to work with that. However, if you're going to select a new instrument or you're going to continue to use one that you already have, there's still this requirement to ensure that the development of something in-house or the selection of something that um, you are already using and want to continue to use or something that you want to start using goes through this broad consultation process. And then there's the requirements to submit the findings from the campus climate assessments, both to the state board. We will be required to do a summary report um, by 2024 but also to publish these findings on your campus websites. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about some of the expectations specifically around each of these areas. Okay, Christina. So in order to get um, some, some clarity on both what we're trying to interpret from the legislative bill, but also making sure that we're getting clarity on what constitutes meaning and value in these activities for our colleges. Um, the State Board conducted several consultation se sessions. Uh, we invited students and faculty of color uh, to meet with us and talk to us and inform us about their priorities, their concerns, their expectations, their experiences of previous uh, campus climate assessments and listening and feedback sessions, uh, and really give us some, um, some structure. We're thinking about how we can make sure that the guidance that we Submit and the direction that colleges go forward um, is meaningful, is relevant, and is transparent. Uh, and I want to say, just give a big shout out to the faculty and the students and the staff that participated in that. I really appreciate they were very open, and very honest, um, and it was extremely valuable. The Diversity and Equity Officers Commission, um, a subgroup that's looking at 5227, also met with um, the State Board, um, Ha and uh, her team and myself. And again, I want to say how much I appreciated um, their contributions, the energy and the openness uh, about their uh, expectations uh, and made, making a really important point. Um, and I'm gonna bring this up because the, the bullet here is about how the diversity and equity officers and the research staff and colleges need to work together. And historically, it has often been the assumption that um, any kinds of surveys will sit primarily within IR offices. That's not necessarily true across all campuses, um, but th there is certainly that, um, that record. Um, and this is a very different situation. 
And while your campus researchers are going to be very important in terms of their experience of the logistics of how you communicate and implement and collect data from surveys um, and assessments, the subject matter experts are your diversity and equity officers and your students, faculty, and staff that are involved in this consultation process. So it's really important that those two work together. And I've been very appreciative that um, the Research and Planning Commission has a subgroup that's looking um, within their DEI subgroup at 5227 and 5194. Uh, and then the, their communication um, with me, and I'm working very closely with Ha and her team so that we can make sure that the DEOC subgroup and the Research and Planning Commission uh, DEI subgroup on these bills are in regular communication and that we have very consistent messaging about roles and responsibilities. You will find in the, um, in the Google Drive, there is the, the first submission of our guidance document, primarily for the campus climate assessments, but you'll see there's some content in there that also relates to the listening and feedback sessions. Um, there will be additional resources that we will add to that. Those will be living documents. So as colleges move through this and we can learn from their experiences, uh, we'll continue to update those so that they stay very timely. Um, and the Research and Planning Commission's uh, DEI subgroup is working on a resource bank uh, that will provide some technical information and support around um, things like uh, administration experiences with different um, proprietary tools or in-house tools uh, and some of the logistical components. And that will hopefully help to inform um, the, the DEI officers and their consultation groups on some of the strategic factors around actually administering these CCAs and some of the legal issues that sit around them. Hey, Christina. So this is this is a summary of, of the overarching principles that came out of those consultation sessions. And primarily they fall into these three areas. The first of these campus climate assessments must be inclusive. And that refers back to that um, consultation of how they're selected, but also consultation, broad college consultation on how your campus climate assessments are communicated and administered. Uh, there was a lot of feedback around ensuring that all students, faculty, and staff are able to participate. And that means being able to meet the needs of any student, faculty, or staff uh, in terms of disability access, um, technology access, uh, multiple languages in some cases, uh, and just being very thoughtful about the experiences of the participants as they learn about the CCAs, um, how they will feel about participating in those, and their ability to access your campus climate assessments, and also to access your findings and be involved in that process. The campus climate assessments need to be transparent. Um, the encouragement that uh, campus climate assessments really must be administered and analyzed and published with integrity and openness. Um, it's very significant here, the, the amount of feedback that we had around ensuring that, um, especially with regards to things like uh, survey fatigue, that in managing the perception of how a campus climate assessment has been selected, what its purpose will be and its potential for impact is very important. Um, and by being transparent, being clear about the processes that a college is using, uh, but being open to having that conversation where those processes might not be deemed to be fully inclusive. And then the campus climate assessments need to be impactful. The findings from the campus climate assessments should be used to inform DEI strategic plans um, and professional development programs, but and it's actually, it's clearly defined in the bill, the expectation that the findings from campus climate assessments will be utilized to create a, some significant campus change. And that also includes the consultation process, uh, ensuring that DEI officers and students are involved in the development of recommendations as a result of the findings of these activities. And that's, the goal is for these findings to be a very meaningful part of college improvement. Uh, and that uh, it really gets to the heart, I think, is some of the frustrations and concerns that, that came to us uh, about historically how these activities have taken place. Um, this now is a very comprehensive and mandated and defined process, uh, and it needs to be, it, it needs to make a difference. Okay, Christina. 
Uh, so some of the outcomes, um, these are some of the technical outcomes. Uh, colleges must publish annually on their website the results of their campus climate assessments or their listening sessions or both. Uh, whatever they are conducted during the year need to be published there. Um, colleges are encouraged and expected to use their findings to inform their DS plans and their professional development training. And colleges are encouraged to maximize transparency with open communication with students, faculty, and staff on their campus climate assessment selection or design, the implementation, the analysis, and the application of the findings. Now, by the end of 2024, the State Board will be required to prepare a report for the legislature that will include a minimum of the summary of the results of the completed CCAs. Now, how what that will look like will we'll, we'll envision when we get a bit closer to the date and we kind of see the, the sort of information that's coming in. Uh, but it's very important here that this also reflects that process. And so the State Board will be applying the same principles to preparing that report that we are expecting colleges to share as they publish the results of their findings. At this point, there is no requirement to do any additional benchmarking or peer comparison studies. Um, however, there's certainly the potential for that to evolve or for requests to come to us from colleges or groups of colleges to look more specifically at that. Now, in order to maximize the contribution of campus climate assessment to the DEI strategic plans and other programs in development, we are strongly encouraging colleges to complete their initial CCA before July 1st of 2022. So that does take into account that you may have campus climate assessments that you've already administered or you've administered perhaps in the last 18 months that you want to use that may or may not have gone through um, an acceptable process. We do encourage you to still use those findings. Uh, and there may be some colleges that feel that it is um, they would have a better reach for their students if they waited till fall quarter. It, that's not that's not unreasonable. Um, but we really want to encourage colleges to make sure that they have the most valid and meaningful and current uh, data available from their their campus community as they think about their strategic plans. But this also is an ongoing process. The iterations of the campus climate assessments and the feedback sessions will should be able to continually inform the strategic plans as those evolve and improve over time. Now, there's been a lot of questions that have come our way around the specific campus climate assessment instruments, and uh, the legislation describes that the state board uh, would be producing a model campus climate assessment. However, responding to the, the feedback that we've had, um, the decision was made that we would not prepare a standard campus climate assessment, uh, partly because that is a very sophisticated activity um, and needs to have professional input, but also because we wanted to encourage colleges to identify instruments that were most meaningful to their particular college um, and enable them to adapt and select uh, according to what they understand their, their needs to be. And there was also um, uh, a lot of interest and concern around transparency and uh, confidence and participation. And so we will be providing a list of suggested existing campus climate assessments. Uh, we are not making any endorsements, any commercial endorsements of any of these, uh, but in the guidance document, and I'll show you a list at the end of these slides too, of some of the available campus climate assessments that are out there both for students uh, or staff and faculty, or in some cases both, um, that are felt to meet the expectations of the bill. Many of those are already in use by colleges. Now, again, if you want to continue to use those, there still needs to be a consultation process that takes place to determine that that is the most appropriate tool for your campus. But I'll talk a little bit more about those later. Um, there is the potential for the state board to require colleges to repeat their campus climate assessments if they are not seen to meet the expectations of the bill. Um, I, I'm hopeful that that will not happen. Uh, but if you have any questions or concerns in this process, please reach out to Ha or her team or myself, uh, and we can have a conversation with you. So many people have already reached out to me describing the process that they've gone through um, and how they've selected their tools and what their plans are. And I really encourage people to do that. I'm very open to that. Feel free to contact me or to contact Ha, um, and we can meet and, and talk about um, what your plans are, um, what your concerns are, and make sure that this process um, does fully meet the expectations of the bill. 
interesting enough. So in selecting instruments, um, there are some things to think about, uh, whether you choose to go with something in-house or uh, you want to choose a commercial tool. Um, and I think with, this is just a quick summary of some of the benefits and disadvantages of both. Uh, with commercial instruments, I think one of the most significant advantages is going to be the impartiality. Because the data is collected, analyzed by a, a third party, and the summary reports are returned back to the colleges, there, you might find that you have more confidence from participants in their confidentiality, uh, in their participation, um, and in the transparency of the analysis. Uh, most of these are reasonably affordable. Um, they are efficiently administered. Uh, they are professionally developed questions. Um, many of them have already gone through a central institutional review board, which may have wow. the process depending on what your campus requirements are. And a lot of them will wow. also enable national benchmarking or comparisons or even regional ones if that's important to your college. However, they do come with a cost. Um, they do come with mostly standardized questions, although most of the commercial instruments will allow some um, personal developed questions. But we provide links to the available um, sample survey so that you are able to go through and kind of determine which types of these commercial instruments might be best suited to your campus. In-house instruments do not enable a college to be much more specific about the type of questions and content that they want to cover. Um, you have complete control over your administration timeline, and you can adapt and evolve your campus climate assessment to meet any specific needs or areas where you feel like you need to have a deep dive. Um, and they're also much more, um, they're, they're much more suitable if you feel like with your campus population, um, it would be significant and important to translate your campus climate assessments into other languages. That said, many of the commercial providers will do that as well. Uh, the disadvantages are, as I mentioned, concerns about the transparency and impartiality. Um, you may have an in-house institutional reward review board process that might slow down the, your ability to progress with this. Um, and there will still be costs of resources to design this, administer it, and analyze the results. And when you take into the cost value of time, comparing that to some of the commercial instruments, um, you might get a more, um, uh, uh, might get a different perception of where the costs are. And as mentioned in the uh, spreadsheet before, there is some funding available under these bills to help support colleges, not specifically for this activity, but as part of that informing those development uh, processes that those funds are available. Next. There were some questions raised um, in this process about colleges working in consortia um, to purchase um, campus climate assessments, proprietary ones, uh, or design their own. Um, and there, that's perfectly acceptable, uh, and it does have some advantages. It will enable colleges perhaps to negotiate um, some reduced pricing. Some of these proprietary tools will do um, bulk group reductions in cost, um, and a lot of them will enable you to do group benchmarking. You'll be able to have colleges with some com you'll have common questions that you'll be able to compare with your peers. Um, however, that does not create a consortium process. So if you choose to go in a consortium for either a student or a staff and faculty survey or something that does both, you still need to meet the requirements to consult with your own faculty, student, DI officers, and staff, um, and publish the findings from your own college on your website, not consortium results. Next. Now, for the administration of campus climate assessments, um, this really is about inclusion. And we really want colleges to be thinking very strongly about strategies that ensure that all students and employees are able to participate. And that means that they need to be appropriately informed in a timely manner of the administration of CCA and how they will participate. And they need to have that in a timely way. They need to have it in a method appropriate to them um, and their particular needs. And that may also include multiple languages. Uh, and it needs to be clear that this, the, the notification and the administration of the assessment does not include any particular group of students, staff, or faculty because of accessibility, technology, or any other support issues. We need to ensure that the participation of students under 18, other than emancipated minors, includes appropriate parental consent. Many of the proprietary instruments will remove the, find the results from students that are under 18 um, or will expect that those are filtered out. But if you have large running start college in the high school or alternative high school populations, it's important to be aware of this. 
Keep to ensure that adequate services are available for participants that experience trauma or distress from participating in the CCA. The process of, of reflecting on your lived experiences, um, your experiences both before and joining a college, just simply going through and answering the questions can create experiences and reflections of trauma and distress. It is very important that colleges think about that ahead of time and ensure that they have the adequate services available to students and that faculty and staff and that they are aware and able to access those services. For some colleges uh, where the demographics of their students, staff and faculty show populations in significant numbers in different languages, uh, we really encourage colleges to consider communicating and administering the CCA in those multiple languages. Uh, it's also important to think about how you analyze those results. There are cultural significances, not just in, it's not just a straight translation, but to be very sensitive to the cultural significance of how uh, the, the questionings in your campus climate assessments are translated, but also in the cultural understandings about how you work with those results when they come back in a, in a student's primary language. So here you can see some of the student survey tools um, that have been considered to be suitable. This is not an exhaustive list. We, we would be very excited to see more and learn about more um, and be able to review those um, and add to this list. Um, most of these are in use at at least one college in the system already. Uh, some use more than one. So these are not, should not be unfamiliar across the system. Um, and the next one. Next slide. And then for employees, um, some of these student surveys are designed to meet the needs of both students and faculty and staff. So the diversity and equity campus climate survey from HEADS um, and the Sound Rock and DEI survey are designed, their questions are designed with that in mind. Um, PACE, the personal assessment of the college environment, that is a, um, a specifically designed for faculty and staff, not for students. Um, and this one, um, and as you'll notice, see in the notes, some of the others, uh, a lot of these um, organizations that are developing these tools are really responding to the increasing demand for uh, perceptive and appropriate um, questions and content around DEI. And they are continually developing those and adding units and components. Uh, and so where those are available, we've included that in this list um, with the hope that that will be considered. In most cases, the, um, the, the racial equity and the racial diversity uh, and the discrimination subscales that are available on these are typically available at least in the short term free of charge. Next. So the listening and feedback sessions, um, this is going to be very complicated. Um, there, there are a lot of questions about this. Um, there's a lot of unanswered <laughs> questions about this, uh, and you know I want to reassure everyone that that we are really encouraging colleges to to communicate with us about their experiences um, as they go forward with these. And in the past, we got a lot of excellent feedback from um, particularly students about their experiences of prior focus groups uh, and what their expectations would be um, to have a more effective environment for that. Um, and in the guidance document, there's a summary of those responses. Um, and I found them extremely valuable and very insightful. And there's some quick summaries here of some of the key points that came out. Um, and again, here, transparency was very significant. Um, there was a, a concern about reluctance to participate openly in, in such a, a conversation um, if they are working with somebody from their own campus. So there, we, we're looking at um, some possible networks and support to be able to select and train facilitators, um, perhaps working with some community groups um, or with some of the universities to bring in uh, expert facilitators that are not part of your, your college community. Um, we will be looking at some of the transcription tools uh, to enable the qualitative analysis of your findings. It is very time consuming to work with this kind of data and this quantity of data, of qualitative data, uh, to do it effectively and to do it quickly. And so we're going to be looking at some of the tools that might be available um, for colleges to use when they think about what they're going to do with their findings. Participant compensation is a very complex area. Uh, there's a lot of questions to be asked. Um, and I know that a lot of colleges are working through their foundation to be able to compensate uh, participants for uh, participating in these feedback sessions. Um, we really encourage colleges if they have concerns about their compensation process um, to reach out to us. 
Uh, we have other people also in the state board who are filling some of these questions. It's not a new concern. Um, so we're trying to kind of make sure that we can produce something that provides colleges with guidance on the best way and the most um, uh, appropriate way to go forward with that with the number of restrictions that we have. Uh, and again, the inclusivity and, com and accommodation to ensure that no student, faculty, or staff is prohibited from participating in a listening and feedback session. And again, making sure that the resources and support for participants uh, who experience trauma or distress as part of this participation are available to them. Hello, sir, people. Can you hear me? Uh huh. Yes. Hello. Yes. Uh, yes. Um, I would like to humbly submit that this particular component is extremely um, foundational for the assurance of what we call transparency and objectivity and inclusivity, and also creating community after the results have been gathered, garnered, and disseminated. And so uh, whatever uh, that our beloved SBCTC uh, community comes with, look at the assertive steps and provide it to everyone, even if they don't even know to ask for it. It be so um, such a... Dr. Hunt, I think we lost you. Uh, yeah. Did you, uh, I, I finished. Great, thank you. Uh, so thank you, Summer, uh, for that recap. Uh, and again, all of these uh, items are in that shared Google Drive. So please take a, a, some time to review the, the guidance document, particularly uh, around the stakeholder input. Um, there was such incredible feedback that we, see, we received from the students uh, and faculty of color. Um, I wanna make sure that you take into consideration as you um, think of your next steps on this item. So we're running a little bit behind on time, uh, but I'm going to just really briefly move over this slide. I think Christina dropped into the chat a link to the faculty diversity model template uh, so that all of you can see. Uh, but this is an area within uh, 5194 uh, within the DEI strategic plans in which uh, <clears throat> our, uh, I'm sorry, I, you can probably tell I'm, I'm trying to fight back cough a little bit. Uh, uh, but before I start in on this, I want to uh, draw attention to uh, the collaborative nature that uh, the state board EDI team, as well as uh, the research team has worked so tightly uh, together on these items. And I would encourage again for uh, colleges to replicate this uh, same approach. Be inclusive of your DEO uh, EDI officers and the uh, their their expertise, their talents, and their knowledge in this space, allow them to take leadership um, for this work um, as you work collaboratively together regarding the either the CCA um, uh, selection and implementation, but as well as the faculty diversity program. Uh, so in just really briefly covering the faculty diversity program itself, um, again, in keeping with the decentralized nature of the community and tech college system, and the aspect of local control for each individual college, the state board took the approach to not mandate a specific program to be created and delivered, uh, but use the same approach uh, with the CCAs as we are with this one. And that is to provide a list of resources um, and guidance and a model template for considerations for colleges uh, to assist them in developing their own faculty diversity programs. And the resource list within that document is solely intended to provide options in support of each college's uh, faculty diversity program. And there's no requirement for colleges to use any of those resources. Uh, but one of the things that um, I wanna, I hope I'm remembering correctly, I think it was Stephanie that pointed to all the incredible work that's been going around our system for many, many years, many on a grassroots level. She uh, pointed to DEHPD and a number of other uh, endeavors. And that is something that we're working to incorporate and elevate uh, some of those strategies. Another is a search advocacy piece. You'll find that in the uh, template as well. Uh, we're also looking at possible 
February sessions, uh, much like these January ones that will focus specifically on uh, the faculty diversity program and piece. So stay tuned for that. But the faculty diversity uh, template uh, intends to provide colleges a blueprint to assist with the development of their program, which again is a key component in their DEI strategic plans. Um, and it gives the colleges opportunity to highlight their current efforts for diversifying faculty on their campuses to be able to build on those because again, many colleges have already started this work um, and assist in highlighting areas for consideration. So uh, two of the main points that you see in front of you, those two bullet points, uh, first two bullet points are uh, pulled right out of the actual language of the bill. And that is the particular program developed must be designed to provide for the retention and recruitment of faculty from all racial, ethnic, and cultural backgrounds and must be based on proven practices for diversity hiring processes. Um, again, State Board won't uh, mandate a specific program. We provided a model template instead. Uh, to assist colleges in this endeavor. We also look to streamline some of the work that's already been done. Uh, and that's uh, from the Workforce Diversity Plan. Many of you may be aware uh, that colleges were required to submit a workforce, workforce Diversity Plan by December of 2020 to the Office of Financial Management. Um, and so all colleges should have submitted that already. Uh, the template is built off that plan so that uh, the building of your diversity program is informed both from that plan and the work that and to honor the work that you've already done. Uh, so much of the work in building this may have already been done on your campuses um, by purview of the workforce diversity plan that was submitted to OFM. Uh, if you have any questions about that whatsoever, you might check with uh, your HR offices uh, in regards to that. They would have been the individuals uh, who submitted that actual plan. But uh, as far as working uh, together with our HR office, I've been working with, our team has been working with the HR office uh, within the state board uh, to adapt this template to help assist colleges in this work as well. Uh, so again, stay tuned for some possible uh, February sessions that will focus particularly on this item. And I will move to hand it over now to Dr. Rashida Willard uh, from Clark College to kick off our college highlight series. Thank you so much, Ha. Um, I appreciate all the work that you all are doing um, in SBCTC um, in conjunction with everyone else um, to get these bills up and running and to get us some guidance. So I appreciate this. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about a program we already have in place called the BUILD program. It's our um, Broadening Understanding Intercultural Leadership and Development program. It is something we developed about three years ago as a cohort model, um, which I'll talk about a little bit. Um, and it is a pretty comprehensive professional development um, uh, training. And um, we, so I guess you can go to the next one. Sorry, <laughs> just thinking about that. Um, this professional development opportunity is directly aligned with our college and board priorities around um, improving conditions for our um, systemically non-dominant students, um, staff, and faculty. And so Clark College facilitates student learning by providing the conditions that improve educational outcomes and eliminates systemic disparities among all groups. So our strategies through the um, improving intercultural competencies, um, we want to improve our intercultural competencies through professional development and hiring employees reflective of the college's diverse student population. We also have added um, now that we are adding a transformative mindset. So it's not about just um, providing the training, but we're also, um, focusing on application of the training and making sure that this training is uh, transformational to our college community. All right. So the purpose of this program is to build intercultural competence, competency and equity leadership in Clark College staff, faculty, and students, and also to provide power, privilege, and inequity opportunities through listening, learning, and practicing social equity. Um, in alignment with our strategic plan, the BUILD program aims to improve intercultural and multicultural competencies among our students and staff. Um, so you can see the thing that is different about this program is that we are not only just putting 
um, like I said, we're not just um, you know doing a training, but we're actually putting our, our folks to work after um, they have completed this training program. Next one. So currently we, this is an optional program. Um, and I know I'm presenting this, um, this is something that's already in place, um, but now with the, uh, with the bills, we have to um, think about how we make it um, mandatory. And I think um, it may need to be modified a bit um, because this is pretty comprehensive. Um, so any right now, any Clark College employee that wants to, employee or student, I should say, because we have students in our cohorts as well, um, if they want to become BUILD certified, it's a certification program. Um, they have to take an assessment before starting the program and then after. And I'll kind of go over a little bit about that assessment a little later. Um, and then they have to choose five of our core modules, which you'll see some of those modules as well. They are two hours a piece. So that means that they have to complete 10 hours um, of, of the training um, before June 1st. And then uh, we have equitable decision-making, which includes an equitable decision-making tool. That is a required course. Um, the program starts October 1st. We do kind of a kickoff, um, bring everyone in the space, tell them how much time they will be um, devoting to this program. And it finishes June 1st, but we actually finish around May um, with uh, presentations, which I'll go over again. Um, the cohort meets once a quarter after certification to um, keep discussing. We want them to continue to build those competencies. Um, they refresh their training, they talk, um, they have you know, a team site that they talk and we, we've labeled each of the cohorts as a, a color. So the first one was gold cohort and then it was the blue cohort. Now we're on the green cohort right now. And they are, um, they, they kind of become this, this family, um, if you will. Next slide. So in this cohort model, we've, <clears throat> we usually have between 35 and 40, sometimes a little bit over 40 folks um, in the cohort. We, to make it more personal, we, they have build buddies. And so um, what we do is we break them out into groups of four or five and they meet with their build buddies. Uh, we have them meet at, at least once a month or um, on their own time, get to know their folks, debrief um, any sort of learning or um, anything that they've learned, anything that they're grappling with. And um, it makes it a little bit more personal. So they're doing that work in those smaller groups as well. We also meet um, once a month. We have this optional space, which we call Build Chats um, once a month. And I think that might be on the next slide. Nope. OK, that's OK. I'll, I'll talk about that. Um, we have build chats once a, a month and they, they jump into the chat. We talk about different things. So one of them being leading with racial equity and we talk about the state board's mandate or a mandate but vision statement um, and what that means for um, how they do their work. We talk about implicit bias. We unpack, they take the IAT. We unpack um, white supremacy culture. We talk about current events that are happening in the world, um, things that are happening around um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. We try to use a really intersectional lens. Um, so looking at things that might be facing, um, you know, uh, people with disabilities or whatever's happening in the world at that time. And they unpack that with their build buddies every, every uh, month. And so it's kind of structured. We have um, PowerPoint presentations, and then they go into their breakout rooms with their buddies and they kind of talk about it. And then we come back to the group and um, unpack it in the larger group. Here's a list of, um, go back, sorry. Here's a list of courses that, um, we, that we have developed in this training program. Um, they can choose between um, any of these and they have to have at least five one of those being equitable decision-making. But what happens in the cohort is people are so invested that they usually try to jump into every single training, whatever training they want to. 
Um, so we have safe zone one and two, we have beyond the binary, impact of microaggression, stereotype threat, best practices to support dreamers, power privilege and inequity 101. Um, red, white, and brown, we've had to contract out now with, with our Melissa being gone, um, but we're keeping it on the roster. Um, <laughs> Disability Justice 101, Equitable Decision Making, Inequities in the Workplace, White Women in Power, Intersectionality, uh, Critical Race Theory, and Cultural Appropriation. We are adding more trainings all the time. So our, our team, we try to keep it fresh. We try to keep new trainings um, going. Um, one thing that's really important to me is that the team is really developed. The, you know, my Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion are, are really developed so that they can provide these trainings. And so um, we try to get them to as many uh, different prof professional development um, opportunities as possible. Um, next one. I talked a little bit about this build chat already. Like I said, once a month, we um, talk about different things to try to move through PPI issues. So um, implicit bias, like I said, they take that implicit association test. That's the very first one. So we start with the kickoff. That's the very first one that they do. We do that because um, we feel it's important for them to um, understand that we all have implicit bias and that they have to know where it shows up and how it shows up um, when they do their work leading with racial equity, white supremacy culture, facilitating conversations on equity and race. And then, like I said, the current event articles. <laughs> oh, oh, I did put it in there. Um, I hope that this, um, y'all can hear, but this is uh, a video that uh, one of our folks put together um, about the BUILD program, so. <laughs> schools to recruit and mentor students of color into and through STEM programs at Clark. Infusing equity into, into the very fabric of making decisions to transform this college. We're proposing the creation of a decal, just like with the one we have, like uh, the, safe zone, the safe zone penguin that symbolizes or supports. To do a build program starting with the student leadership training, Right, so embed it with student leadership. So then student leaders are able to recognize white supremacy culture on campus. And um, a multi-month event to bring in tax uh, preparers for low-income students to utilize at no cost. I wanted to look at how we could use the white supremacy culture framework and equity-mindedness uh, to disrupt racism in our syllabi. My, my topic is implicit bias and stereotype threats in academic advising. These were the greatest people to work with, and I really enjoyed and I couldn't have worked with my people who were more devoted to this thing. No. Thank you for um, creating the opportunity to have the BUILD program, um, Rashida, and the small but mighty ODEI team. I'm so proud um, to have worked with you this year. And also, um, thank you to all of the 43 participants, I think we ended up um, having who said that you wanted to learn more and that you were willing to step up to make a difference. Like I said, um, they it's not just about them learning all year long, it's about them putting their learning into practice. And with that, we also use them throughout the year. So we keep a roster um, and we use those folks throughout the year to serve on committees or to, um, to like, uh, you know, be equity representatives because they get this pretty intensive training um, for the year. So it really helps to have folks um, at the table. And so it helps in terms of not tokenizing folks. Um, before what we were hearing was, you know, uh, you know, we need more people of color on our committees, or we need more whatever that looks like. But instead of tokenizing folks, you have, you get to choose 
between whoever you want to serve on this committee. It's not um, just, you know, brown folks or queer folks or whatever. It's, you know, a group of folks who have been trained. Um, so you can see that these were some of the capstone, capstone um, people uh, wanted to talk about how do we create um, how do we create real allies and advocates for justice? And so their proposal was to, to mandate using pronouns um, and meeting agreements and kind of a train the trainer, train the trainer model. Um, if you go to the next one. Another one, this one was really awesome. This group looked at how white supremacy culture is embedded in our holiday uh, schedule. And they literally talked about every single one and how it, um, how it embodied, embodied um, uh, white supremacy culture. And their proposal was to give all employees 10 floating holidays and you could just use it anytime you wanted. So if folks are not in the dominant culture, then they would be able to celebrate whatever holidays they wanted. So it just really gets people to thinking about um, thinking about equity in different ways. And it's very, very, uh, it, I feel like it, it just helps them to start thinking about those things. And then the last one is assessment. Oh, okay. I'll just talk about assessment really quick. I thought I had a slide, but uh, with assessment, we have, um, we assess before and we set, assess after their, um, their, they're done with the program. Uh, we assess three different sections. One is knowledge, one is skills, and one is attitudes. So we're really looking at, um, do you know the stuff? Um, how do you do the stuff? And then uh, do you even have a willingness to do the stuff? And so it's like, we're, we're trying to look really uh, well-rounded. And so we're seeing that all of our numbers go up really well in the knowledge and the skills, but the willingness, it doesn't go up very well. So people are not more willing to be interrupters or to, um, to sort of apply um, their knowledge based on the training. So then we just have to go back and, and revamp a little bit. And so we're just using that data to improve the program. And that's it. That's beautiful, Rishi, or Dr. Willard. Thank you for sharing all of the good work of Clark College and looking to scale and uh, really advance this portion of the legislation. You've been doing it for a good long time. I wanna hand it over now to uh, Parfait Basle from South Puget Sound Community College to talk about how they have incorporated their outreach to communities of color as well as their peer mentoring strategies. Thank you, Ha. Thank you uh, to the team, Melissa, Christina, for having me here. Thanks, everybody um, who is joining this info session. And uh, thank you very much, Dr. Rashida Willier. This was a really great, great presentation and insightful work that you do in there at Clark College. Um, so I know we pressed for time. I'm going to go through my slide deck quite rapidly here. Uh, I was asked to talk a little bit more about some of the strategies that we're using at South Puget Sound Community College uh, related to um, the dimension of peer mentoring strategies um, that the bills are requiring um, colleges to do, as well as the student outreach program. Uh, so quickly by myself, uh, I'm the executive diversity officer at South Puget Sound Community College. I've been at the college for the last four years initially in the capacity of the director of the Multicultural Center and more recently within the last two years as the executive diversity officer. And so um, that positions me actually really nicely to talk about this program, um, the peer mentoring program, um, because that was one of the initial charges that I was given um, when I got hired as a director of the Multicultural Center to stand up a program um, that was inspired by the TRIO-like uh, program that's federally funded. Some of your colleges have that, uh, but unfortunately because of the demographic uh, composition of our um, student population at South Puget Sound Community College, we're not eligible for that federal grant. So um, we had to kind of think about what do we do um, in order to support um, students who, um, 
uh, fit the, 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 the characteristics of low income, first generation, uh, students with disability, or students who identify as students of color. Um, so um, so the, the peer mentoring strategies really came straight up from that um, attempt to stand up a program similar to the TRIO-like uh, model, but with alternative ways of funding the program. So uh, next slide, I can expand on that a little bit further. So the starting point for any design for any program or initiative at the college, we really try as much as we can to root it in our equity principles. Um, and so that's the starting point. Um, and it, it helps keep us grounded. And as we, we stumble upon barriers or challenges, uh, trying to use that as a North Star to try to figure out solutions. So the three guiding principles that we, we attempt to use at the college are first, you know, we center the people we serve and meet them where they are. Um, with that, that focus, the institution, the history, uh, our comfort ends up being what is centered, uh, traditions, ways we've always done things. Um, but we try to go back to, okay, who, who is uh, the focus here? Uh, who are we trying to serve and trying to meet them where they're at? Secondly, we continually identify the barriers to academic and professional um, success and try to remove them. And thirdly, but not least, in the design and fine tuning of our processes and finding solutions, we try to involve those most impacted when making decisions. Um, so with that as a framework, um, next slide, please. Uh, we, we first started our journey with the, 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 the program um, was, uh, we started with Ignite, which, you know, as, as the title uh, implies, the idea of igniting a fire, um, a passion, um, a potential that is existent and dormant, but oftentimes suffocated by the challenges of a system. Uh, or uh, lack of resources. And so we wanted to, to, uh, to start with Ignite. And so the way we did it was, it was a very, um, how do I phrase it? Um, a, a wide gate, if you will, if I can use that metaphor of entry for that program. So anyone who fit the profile of low income or identified as students of color or had a documented disability with our institution um, or um, were first generation, so their parents didn't uh, go to college. Um, they were eligible to be in the program. Any of that um, was a check they could get into the program. And so there was a little strategy in that as, as well, um, because we also had anticipated a lot of the, 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 the pushback and the backlash and also some of the conversations around why certain student group over other student groups um, so we really wanted to have a wide net um, entry point into these equity programs and then build on the data to go further and become a little more specific. So, so we started with Ignite, which was about three year. The program is in its fourth year now. Um, and then um, last year, based on the data, because um, when we looked at the data of retention, quarter to quarter persistence, um, our Black and African-American students were the ones who were not as successful as their counterparts at our college. So we use that data to drive um, the, the design of an iteration of Ignite called Black Scholars. Um, and, and essentially similar services and that they will be in the, in the next slide, uh, but with a focus on the Black and African American uh, identities, if the students so identify um, those characteristics as being important to them. Um, if you don't mind, uh, next slide. And so what do students get? What we advertise as part of the program is you know, a sense of community. We put them into cohorts. Um, they are assigned a dedicated educational planner. We have those across our system, various terminologies depending on the college, but they have a, we have a designated uh, ed planner in our multicultural center who works with students. And they get assigned a peer mentor, um, a, a fellow student who, who has gone through the institution um, and so knows relatively well how to navigate the system and the resources, um, and we, they get paired up um, to that mentor. They also get access to laptops, textbooks. Um, those are automatically, so the textbooks are automatically provided uh, to the students every quarter, and then they, those get returned at the end of the quarter, and it's just this rotation uh, process. And the laptops are just being, being funded. They're there if a student needs a laptop, they just go and check it out and they use it. Um, we are trying to actually go into a model where 
Um, it's just something they get as part of the package, but we, we're trying to get some funding for that. And um, they get access to early registration to classes uh, because we, we've, we, we have instances where students, you know, because either uh, because of financial uh, barriers and or just not being on top of the game are kind of late to register to a class that would be important for their graduation and therefore they're delayed. So we've been able to work within the institution to to ensure that students in that program, in those programs, have early registration. We, we organize a registration day where they're, you know, there's food catered, uh, they're there with an ed planner and we ensure that they get into the classes that they need to get into. Um, we provide funding to accept, you know, to participate in the student call the conference as well and any other conferences that might be pertaining to um, a, a salient part of their identities. Uh, and we provide a number of uh, workshops and trainings around identity development, uh, academic skills, life skills, um, connections to work opportunities uh, beyond graduation, transfer, uh, financial aid, and the list goes on. Uh, but one thing that we do slightly differently with the Black Scholars pro uh, Program, which was an equity intervention in order to really address that gap in the data, uh, was we, we worked with um, the, the foundation and some donors in our community to really raise a lot of money. And, and really the fiscal point is the challenge here. We would love to implement the same model with our Ignite program, but um, it's just a bigger student pool. So it makes it hard to, to make it sustainable. But with the Black Scholars right now, because we still have, a, um, we are averaging around 60 students. Um, we've built this model around the SAI milestones um, that our, our system uses to, to, um, to monitor the progress and retention of students uh, through our system. And so when students, and we know based on the data, that when students complete their uh, their 45 college credits, so uh, 45 SAI points, their likelihood of graduation and completion just go through the roof. And so based on that that data point, we built a model where when, you know, of incentivization essentially. So when students really complete that, um, they get a scholarship of about $500 towards their completion um, as part of being in the program. Um, so we, we've implemented that. We've had our round, our first round of students who got the, inter, uh, the scholarship last, last fall. The first 28 students who joined the Black Scholars Program, um, you know, a lot, uh, about, I think most of them, at the exception of maybe, yeah, 10 of them were first, first year, you know, um, uh, students, but the remaining 10 had already been in college. Um, and so they were able to, and they had already earned about 30 credits or so. So by the, week, the spring quarter, they were able to um, complete their 45 credits and then get their uh, scholarship. And it was just really uh, emotional to see the, the comments and commentaries that came from the students um, and how that was able to remove some of the uh, fiscal barriers to continuing their education. So this is what the students get in a nutshell. Um, but the peer mentor component cannot be under uh, understated in that um, we've built in a model of uh, regular check-ins where the peer mentor has essentially what you will liken to a caseload management model where they have a set of students and we have a ratio of a mentor to about 10 mentees in a program. The, the mentors are being paid through, um, through our operational funds that are being allocated to support the program. And then um, so they have check-ins and there's a set of questions, a questionnaire survey that we've built to help the mentors um, identify what are the barriers the students are dealing with um, at any critical uh, step of the, the quarter, right? So at the beginning, we look at the challenges with registration, um, if there's any challenge of getting into classes or getting their books or uh, assignments and so forth. And then when we go further into the quarter, um, they, they are checking on issues related to class attendance and understanding the material. Um, and, and the list goes on, just really timely uh, check-ins with the students to make sure that there aren't any um, blind, blind spots or issues that just you know sneak up on everybody and then the student has to drop out. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so one of the things that I really wanted to highlight here is the fact that 
um, at the infancy of the program, we had what you would call a traditional enrollment model where we had some clear deadlines of when students needed to apply by and by when we process the applications and then they were notified and then they went through a, uh, your traditional type of orientation model. Uh, but we quickly learned through some of the feedback and, um, and reviewing our data that what we had done was create an elitist model whereby the type A type A type students were doing very well in finding out about the program in time and filling out the applications in time and then getting into the program in time. But for the type B, uh, type B, type C type of students who, you know, they didn't hear about the student in time, uh, didn't hear about the program in time, or by the time they heard about the program, somehow, you know, the deadline was passed. Um, there was no mechanism really to get them into the program and, and to get them to benefit uh, from what we were offering. So we mixed all together the the deadline type of type of model and implemented uh, an ongoing enrollment process into the program um you know and some of it was really thanks some of the positives of the the, the <laughs> pandemic when everything had to move remote um, we had to become a little more innovative in the way we facilitated our orientation and so the compounding effect of all that allowed us to realize that we could systematize some of the orientation processes which used to be a barrier to you know um, the ways in which we, we we implemented folks coming in getting onboarded into the program and then getting them going so so at this juncture there's no deadline to the program we have a timeline by which we expect students to fill out the application and complete the onboarding um, and get assigned to a peer mentor but if they don't complete it within the quarter they have to reassign or redo it the following quarter but at any point any given time when they hear about the program they can get in um, go through a set of modules of orientation and then get paired up to a, a peer mentor and then they're on their way to getting the support that they need um, next slide please so concretely in terms of program outcomes uh, with three years of data and, and counting this is what we found so far, you know, comparatively to others, um, our general student population, uh, for the first uh, 15 college credits, our students are, are doing a lot better than students who are not in the program. Um, and so, so we are reaching that goal in helping students complete their first 15 credits. Um, and that, that we're still doing as well with, um, you know, moving to the second milestone of the 45 college credits. As you can see the number in green there, obviously this data is very skewed by the pandemic having hit the last two years of and knowing the student population and how hit um, low income folks have been by the pandemic and having to drop out in order to take care of sick family and so forth. But still with that trend across the system, um, students in the program are doing well, um, relatively speaking. Um, and the more, next, next slide. Um, yeah, so, so that is regarding the Black Scholars and Ignite um, program. Um, and, and then with regards to the outreach, so the, the piece about the outreach legislation that requires to really intentionally build some outreach programs that ensures some, some, um, some pipeline, if, if you will, of students from high schools um, into um, our college experience in a way that ensures that they're connected to a support model. And so one way that our institution has decided to move forward with that is to hire a full-time outreach specialist. Um, and it was an interesting conversation internally in terms of finding out, okay, where does this person live, right? Do they live under the Office of Diversity and Equity? Um, do they live in the student services side? So the direction we went, and I'm very fortunate, I count my blessings with the collaborative uh, relationship that we've built at South Puget Sound Community College between the various areas. Uh, one of the things that we try to do is to, again, center the student and the person in the role and, and think about where would they be best um, located in order to be successful in this endeavor. And it made sense that given the, the, the work of the outreach department already, the extensive work of outreach in the community, um, that they should be uh, located organizationally there with a dotted line to the Office of Diversity Equity so that they are also looked into some of those, those prerogatives that our office are trying to push uh, forward. So that's the model that we used and there's a lot of flexibility there. We're gonna look at it, try it and see if there's changes that needs to be made. Um, but some of the key features with, uh, with regards to this role is that the person will be full-time they will be um, reporting uh, to the um, director of um, uh, 
uh, strategic partnerships with K to 12 partnerships. I think that's the title we have lately for that. And then they'll have a dotted line to my office. They will also have days dedicated to be in the high school, critical high schools where we know that um, the systemically um, non-dominant uh, students um, that need to come to our college um, are located in our region. So I'm thinking about Yelm, uh, North Thurston in, in our area here. So they will have days that are set up to be actually there on campus, working with students, connecting with students, helping them with financial aid applications and so forth. Um, and then there will also be a critical liaison with some strategic community partners here that we know that we want to build stronger relationships with so that students know about the services like Ignite and Black Scholars that we are offering. Um, so that's our intention with this, this role and the money, and we will give it a try. The, the positions are out in the open, and we were actually very fortunate to have a matching um, from a, a nonprofit in the area that has offered to match this position with another position. So we actually have two positions um, that we will be operationalizing uh, very soon in order to, to, to do this work. So, so that's what I have for you all. Um, and I will look forward to any questions related to um, these two items. That's great. I'm gonna give just a few seconds to see if anyone has any questions for Parfait. Perfect. Do you have, you said you just have one student outreach specialist that kind of does this work? So um, with regards to the, the bill, right, we already had a team of outreach. They still were doing some work, but um, the intention here was to add to the workforce and, and have this person really dedicated to that. Um, but they wouldn't be the only one um, doing it. Any other questions for Parfait? Sounds like not. Thank you, Parfait. That was beautiful. I think uh, one of the things I, uh, that surfaces for me is that collaborative nature at the uh, leadership table in thinking about where these resources might land um, and centering the student in the decision making. So I appreciate that you surfaced that up uh, because that can be a difficult conversation uh, uh, when it comes to. Uh, that decision point, if you will. So uh, appreciate uh, you making note of that and sharing with the group uh, some fabulous work. Uh, I want to point to the time. I apologize uh, for running tight on time today, uh, especially to Jeanette and her team from Yakima Valley who are here to share their good work in developing their DEI strategic plans to share with everybody. Uh, what we're going to be doing instead is pivot uh, just a little bit and possibly add this segment on uh, the DEI strategic plans to the uh, session on the 12th. Uh, so hopefully that works out for the Yakima Valley team uh, as well as anybody else in this room who is uh, very interested in that item to attend again. Uh, next Wednesday, same time, uh, same place. Uh, so I want to wrap and uh, see in front of you the contact information for all the individuals, um, SANS uh, Yakima Valley College group, uh, who presented today the work that they've been doing on their campuses. It's a nice reflection, of course, and pointing to uh, the enduring work that's been happening for a good long time, uh, that these investments, legislative investments, can continue to uh, support as well as build out and scale. Uh, so mm -hmm. thankful to the work of your teams um, and for sharing with everybody in the Zoom room uh, very, very, very much. Uh, next slide, Christina, I think it's, we're, we're wrapping, yeah. So there's contact information for the collective uh, state board team uh, in doing this work with all of you. Uh, please, please, please feel free to reach out at any time should we be able to help provide some additional guidance or uh, any kind of support that you might have? We've been doing some one-on-ones with executive teams as well, one-on-ones um, with individuals. We have an open door policy, uh, of course. So uh, reach out to us at any time to, to be able to meet with us in this endeavor. Uh, but much appreciate all of you uh, and coming into this space together, excited to see where this is going to take us. Uh, we also have a survey quick uh, survey. I should take you less than hopefully three seconds, maybe, uh, to provide us some information so we can uh, look to see how we can do better by all of you uh, at the next go round. 
So again, thank you to everybody here. Uh, thank you to uh, the DEO colleagues and your leadership. Uh, and until next time, know that we are here uh, whenever you need. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so Christina, if you'll stop share screen, it would be great. Thank you all. Where can we, oh, I, I know where we can. <coughs> Never mind. Lim Lim, thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Rashida, were you asking where the uh, documents were? Yeah, I can, I know where they are. Got it. Thank you. Can you send them to the rest of us? To the rest of us? For the rest of us? Yeah. <laughs> yes. I can, I can uh, connect, connect uh, Dr. Hunt. That's great. I think Christina just plopped it back into the chat. Okay. We'll be sending out uh, an email with uh, the link as well again, as, as well as the survey link. And feel free to bookmark the Google Drive too, because we'll mm -hmm. keep things updated. So if you want to get back to it, that's a good idea. All right. Well, cool. thank you, Rashida. Yeah. Thank you. Thank I you. you. Melissa, I wanted you to meet yes. Nicole. Nicole, stellar, 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 yeah. stellar, stellar, stellar. <laughs>